All right. So it looks like our, our numbers are starting to stabilize here. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to our Bow River education session. My name is Janine Higgins and I'll be the facilitator for this evening. So to start off, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I am speaking to you tonight from the traditional territory of Treaty 6 in Edmonton. Uh, but I would like to recognize that we are coming together to talk about the Bow River, which is of course on the traditional territory of Treaty 7. So being that we are coming together online tonight from the traditional territories and homelands of many Indigenous peoples, I'd like to acknowledge all treaties in the province as all of Alberta is treaty land and we are all treaty people. I would also like to acknowledge the long history and deep connections that First Nations and Métis have with this land, and I honour this today in hopes of working together in a good way. So as mentioned, thank you so much for joining us for our Bull River Education session. So I'm going to be taking us through a bit of a welcome with um, just an overview in terms of how our session is going to run this evening before we move into our presentation. So we're very lucky this evening to have two lead presenters who are going to be sharing information with us on the Bow River and the cumulative effects study that Alberta Environment and Parks has been working on before we move into our question and answer section of the evening. So we'll close the meeting off at 8.30 tonight. So for our Q&A, down at the bottom of your screen, or if you're joining from a cell phone, it may be up at the top, you should be able to see a Q&A button that you can click and open. So that's where we're going to be collecting your questions for this evening. So you can go ahead and type your questions in there as Paul and Michael are going through their presentations. And we're also going to be using the upvoting tool for this evening as well. So I see we've got over 100 people online with us tonight with the numbers still climbing, which is really great to see. Um, but what that means is we'd like to use our upvoting tool as a way to choose the questions that we're going to be answering. So if you see a question that's typed in there already that you'd really like to hear an answer to, go ahead and click that upvoting button and we'll be using that as one of the ways that we're sorting through our questions. So of course, for our Q&A, um, a, a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, any inappropriate questions will be deleted, so keep it clean, folks. I'm sure that won't be a problem for tonight. Um, but we are going to be grouping questions together and potentially dismissing questions if we've already responded to them. So our goal for tonight is to provide responses to as many questions as we can about the Bow River in terms of what folks are interested in learning about the fishery based off of the presentation that we hear tonight. So we're also going to be taking some of the pre-submitted questions that folks um, put forward when they registered for the webinar and starting off our Q&A with that. So answering a couple of questions there. And then, of course, Paul and Michael will be answering a bunch of them as they go through the presentation this evening. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. So we have uh, lots of folks here this evening with us, which is great. So Paul Christensen is our senior fisheries biologist who you'll be hearing from shortly. Um, followed up by Michael Sullivan, who is our provincial fish science specialist. So those are our two presenters for this evening. And then on the panel, um, we have Stuart Nadeau, who's our fisheries manager of the South, Shane Petrie, who's our fisheries policy manager, Andrew Paul, who's our provincial uh, flows specialist, who you'll likely hear us refer to as Andy. And then we have both Sarah and Jennifer, also referred to as Jenny, probably this evening, um, on the panel who are going to be responding to your questions. So I've also got a couple of coworkers here, as mentioned, I'll be facilitating tonight, but we've got Alyssa and Jenna here who are going to be making sure that things run smoothly for us on the back end of our session tonight. So um, when we move into the Q&A, they'll turn their videos off and they'll be working away in the background to make sure everything is running smoothly for us. So with that, I would like to pass it off to Paul to take us through his presentation. Hey, thanks, Janine, and uh, and all of the others uh, from AEP that have joined us tonight. And I wanted to, to welcome everyone to an important discussion on the Bow River fishery tonight. Can I uh, can I just get an acknowledgement that you can hear me? Okay. We can hear you well, Paul. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. So I'm just going to go through uh, a, an agenda of some of the things that we're going to talk about in tonight's presentation. So. Just a brief overview of Alberta's fishery management system. This gives a little bit of context for how we manage fisheries and how we allocate fish resources to various user groups. A bit of a history of the Bow River and some of the work that we've done on, on the river in the past. 
uh, a brief presentation on some of the, the fisheries data that we've collected in past years, population estimate, catch per unit effort data, and some angler use information. And then <clears throat> the focus of the evening is, is really on this cumulative effects uh, monitoring and um, assessment that we've been undertaking for the past year. So Alberta's fisheries management system is, <clears throat> is a way that uh, how is, is the, the manner in which we allocate fish. So you can see there's a, there's a decreasing order of priority for how um, resources are, are allocated. First and foremost, uh, fish need to be uh, allocated to its, the population itself to ensure they're sustainable for the future. Uh, second priority would be indigenous harvest. Third would be recreational use. Um, that's your, your typical resident anglers, and then, and then also primarily uh, commercial use. So these types of things you can see in, in, um, in our fish conservation management strategy for Alberta. They recognize these different priorities to maintain biodiversity, honor uh, indigenous fishing rights, to sustain fisheries, <coughs> and to allocate the fish for rec and commercial use. And <coughs> these policies are further articulated in some of our fisheries management frameworks. You can see an example on screen of one of our, our more prominent ones, a, a walleye recreational fisheries management framework. Um, so those are kind of the tools that tell you that get down to the specifics of how we do assessments and how we allocate fish. So what's a, a really important foundation for this is, is that we're, we start with good information, um, understanding what the fish status of our populations looks like through using standardized assessment methods, whether it be gillnet, gillnet surveys for, for some of our pike walleye populations, Many of you may have seen us um, using a large uh, jet boat on the Bow River to assess those populations. And some of our smaller streams, we use backpack electro, uh, electro fishers as well. And then also a key component to this is not just that we collect this data, but that we report on this data and we talk to, uh, to stakeholders to obtain their views and opinions on how we should use that data and what types of things they would like to see um, in their fisheries. So a really important thing uh, to manage any fishery is, is to ensure that we have a proper fishery management objective. In this case, um, we, we're looking at the recreational fishery management objective. And for the Bow River, this has been uh, entrenched for a fairly long time. I, I think it's generally recognized that the Bow River is a, a recreational fishery, primarily for, you know, for sport angling. Um, harvest is not something that has really been um, a part of the Bow River fishery for a couple of decades now. So the way that Alberta Environment Parks Fisheries Management intends to continue to manage this fishery is as a trophy and blue ribbon fishery. So <clears throat> what we're going to talk about tonight is um, what types of trade-offs there may be in order to ensure that we can continue to maintain the fishery at that status and also describe what some of the limitations might be to achieve this status. So while we may endeavor to have a trophy blue ribbon fishery, I, I think we're going to show you some information tonight that, that maybe describes how it is the bow hasn't performed uh, as it has in the past. And we could talk about ways to get us to where we've been before, if that's what is desired. So this, this is just a de depiction of, of what our, our fisheries management cycle looks like. Assessment, status, engagement, um, drafting and management objectives, and then what is, is the typically most forward facing element, which is the fishing regulations. So I think many of you have seen me give presentations before that talk about the stocking history of the bow or all the various um, uses of water on the river. This is a bit of a different historical depiction. And this is really focused on the type of stuff that we've done on the river. So <laughs> this is really only about a two decade timeline, but I should note that important work has been ongoing on the Bow River, at least since uh, the early, uh, the early 80s and, and even maybe uh, back into the late 70s as well. But uh, I think the, the last two decades kind of give us the most current context to help us understand uh, where we're at today. So a pretty notable thing that happened, uh, this was a, quite a fundamental shift in terms of how the bow was being used from a social perspective was 
um, really people started identifying that they were not as interested in eating fish from the boat as they were catching fish from the boat. So in recognition of that and, and with a lot of public involvement and engagement, uh, some of the sport fishing regulation changes were made uh, for the lower Bow River, which saw two fish uh, over 35 centimeter limit change to one fish under 35 limit. And I, I have oversimplified this a great deal. If, if you uh, have the good fortune to fish the boat 20 years ago, uh, probably a good half a page was dedicated to the regulations on the Bow River because there were a variety of different sections with different regulations. Um, so, so this just captured one of the regulation changes. Some parts have been zero harvest for a while, others have had more liberal harvest, but um, this just shows you generally the intent uh, move from uh, focus primarily on harvest to uh, more of a, a conservation and just recreational use fishery. 2006, we did an angler use survey, uh, a creel survey, and um, <clears throat> this was a very key a uh, piece of data that we collected to help us understand um, how much the Bow River fishery was being used, allowed us to obtain important information like catch rates, uh, total number of angling hours, and other important angling demographics. One other thing that we found in that survey was even though uh, people were legally allowed to harvest one fish under 35 centimeters, for the most part they chose not to do that, which further um, re-emphasize the fact that people are, are much more interested in the bow as a, as a recreation sport fishery. A couple of other notable and key biological events that, that I think people remember, the flood of 2013, uh, that would have an effect on, on the river. Uh, it definitely rearranged and changed a lot of the habitats that people uh, recognize as being really good areas for fishing. And in 2016, we recorded uh, whirling disease present for the first time uh, in Alberta. Uh, it's important to note that whirling disease is found in the Bow River. Um, and we'll talk a little bit in some subsequent slides about how we don't think that we've seen an epizootic outbreak of uh, whirling disease, which, which is actually really good news. Um, some of you may remember there was some work that, that was done in 2012 and 2013, where we engaged uh, a variety of uh, members of the public, of the angling public guiding community and, and, and industry representatives to try to assess the Bow River regulations, to try to um, revisit the 2001 reg change iteration. And in that version of the regs, um, the sport fishing regulations were aligned to be consistent across all reaches from Banff to Pisano. Uh, it went from nine, uh, nine reaches, each with different regulations to a single reach, open all year, catch or release, bait ban. And that was to ensure that there was a simplicity in understanding of the regulations, ease of enforcement, and, and really the management objective for all the reaches of the river is, is really similar. Um, so therefore the, the regulation was, was changed to simplify that. When we did change those regulations because of what we found in the angler use survey, which was that people were choosing not to harvest fish, we knew that changing to catch and release was not likely going to make a big difference in the fish population because that's what people were doing anyways. So this brings us closer to the present now where in 2018 we just completed an angler use survey again and if you have not had the chance to look at it, it is located on our website. And I should note with the, with the different blue dots uh, here and, and other gray dots, we have done uh, various forms of population monitoring on the Bow River for at least the last couple of decades. So this presentation tonight isn't specifically uh, uh, a long dis presentation on fish population data, but I do want to set the context for what we're going to talk about and why it's important. I think a lot of people probably recognize this graph. Um, this, this was work undertaken by the University of Calgary, published in 2018, which uh, looked at a long-term data set from the Bow River of population estimates and showed that, that, that the Bow River rainbow trout population was, was in decline. So since then, um, you know, we, we, uh, when that work was done and, and we, were, we were involved in, in that work as well, we were listed as co-authors on that, 
we wanted to take a much finer look at the Bow River to, to try to understand the populations in, in, a, in a different context and to ensure that we are, are uh, managing the fishery property properly and trying to set their trajectory for the next decade and ensure regulations are going to continue to maintain a sustainable fishery. So what you can see from this graph is, is the data is, is highly variable. Um, this goes back a little bit further in time than, than Chris Cahill's work did into the early 2000s. You can see that populations look like they were actually probably quite a bit lower than they might have even been now. Um, but there's there's a number of caveats that go with that data as well. And there's things that, that we just cannot um, fully unpack and maybe understand uh, this, this, um, this far away from that work. We use different boats, we use different electric fishers, different types of gear. And there are a number of different factors affecting Bow River trout populations that may, may have resulted in, 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 um, in those data points. The key here to look at is, is the red line, which uh, no matter how we analyze this data, whether it's catch per unit effort data or population estimate data, the bow still shows that we have a decline in the population. Uh, I, I will draw your attention to the last dot there. Um, <clears throat> our, our teams have been working very hard to try to get some very current information uh, for everyone to see tonight, which is our 2021 population data. And, and you can see that that dot is, uh, is, is definitely higher than it has been in, in some of the previous years, like 2018, 19, and 20. And while that, uh, you know, that, that excites us a little bit, it's important to remember that this is just one year of data as well. We're not popping the champagne corks off, uh, off champagne bottles quite yet, um, because there is a lot of variation in data from a year to year basis. So, it's really important that we continue to monitor population to see what it's doing in the long term. But nonetheless, uh, we are still excited to see that that that, that it doesn't doesn't look like for that data point it's in further decline. But it's still important to recognize the long term decline is intact. This is a little bit of a different way of depicting the data that answers slightly different questions. These are these are called bubble plots. And the size of the bubbles gives you an idea of how many of those specific size classes uh, are present in a given year. So <clears throat> the, the important thing to look at here, if we look at some of the newer data, is, is it, it looks like in 2019 and 2020, we had some pretty strong uh, recruitment years for juvenile fish. And you can see that those, that those fish have grown into the larger size classes, into the, into the 400 millimeter and 500 millimeter size class. This graph can tell us a few things. Um, one thing that, that it says to us uh, most, maybe most importantly, is we don't think that we have a whirling disease signal in the Bow River, an epizootic event that's resulted in a population loss. When we talk to our colleagues in the, in the states, um, what you would see is a complete lack of, um, of recruitment in those juvenile size classes, which would give us an early warning sign that there may be problems on the horizon. But the bow is and always has been a very good system um, to recruit fish. And in part, that's probably because it's a very large watershed and there's different life histories of rainbow trout in the Bow River some that carry out their life history process in the Highwood River, some in the main stem, but that diversity of, of habitat uh, leads to a little bit more population resilience than you might see in a smaller system. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of some of the angler use data. If, if you have ever fished the Bow River, you, you probably noticed that, that it can be quite busy and, and it may appear as though it's getting busier and that's not just, not just your imagination. So the graphs on the upper right, you can see um, are, <clears throat> we did a creel survey in 2006 and a creel survey in 2018. And what we observed was approximately a 15% increase in the angler use of the Bow River over that period, which corresponds almost perfectly to Alberta's population growth rate. Um, doing a creel survey is not something that, that can be done every year. It's very labor intensive and expensive, um, but Anecdotally, uh, we, we know that in 2020, our license sales as a result of COVID 
were up about 30%, which is uh, very similar to what was experienced in other jurisdictions in North America. And some of the uh, angler use surveys we did on some of our very popular Alberta lakes showed increases of about 30 to 50%. So we don't think the Bow River has got any less busy since we did uh, the 2018 survey. Also interesting here, uh, if you look at, at the, the red bar graph, or, or the bar graph on the bottom, the, the red bar is the Bow River 2018. And according to the most recent survey, just by a little bit, the Bow River now exceeds the total angler use of Lesser Slate Lake, which is quite stunning when you think about how large of a water body Lesser Slate Lake is and how relatively small the bow is from a, uh, from a, a, a surface area perspective. So uh, now we're going to start to talk about cumulative effects assessment and the cumulative effects study that, that we've, uh, we've undertaken here. So <clears throat> we've had uh, a lot of interest and there's a lot of passionate stakeholders that have challenged us over the years to, to really start to look at all of the factors that affect the Bow River fishery. Uh, I think we, we know that ang angling is not the only issue on the Bow River. The, uh, the Cahill paper described the Bow River fishery as experiencing multiple stressors. So in response to that, we established a science team in late 2020. And this consisted of a number of representatives from our department, University of Calgary, Trout Unlimited, Bow River Trail Foundation, and Calgary River Users Alliance. So what we really wanted to focus on in this assessment was making sure that we weren't sitting, um, that we weren't just developing and building models by ourselves. We really wanted to test this and build this with some stakeholders um, that had vast knowledge of the Bow River fishery. Um, and that makes our models much more, um, much more rigorous. And it's, uh, it's really good because it, it allows, um, allows questions to be asked of the model that we may not think of ourselves. So it's been a very uh, valuable process for us. And, uh, and now, our, the goal of, of this process was to identify what the threats to the trout population are and to build a cumulative effects model to understand what the relative impacts are. So what people are really usually good at is, uh, is throwing out the ideas of what the cumulative effects are, but the part that doesn't happen is the math behind how, how much is each factor affecting um, the trout. So that's what this project endeavors to do. So there's a couple of uh, different timelines we're on here. In response to this cumulative effects project, you know, what, what we want to do is identify all the threats, but recognizing that our department, uh, fisheries management specifically, is, um, uh, has fishing regulations as its primary regulatory tool. Um, we, we're looking primarily at a lot of the fishery parameters and things affecting the fishery and looking at ways and means to potentially make regulation changes that um, would reduce any threats that might result from angling. Um, those regulation changes can be ongoing. Uh, you know, some may occur in, in, the, in the very near future or, or in the coming years, but what's really important is that uh, we don't just rush to get something small and incremental done we are trying to chart the trajectory of the Bow River for the next decade or more. And we wanna make sure that those regulations are thoroughly vetted with, uh, with the public to make sure that we uh, obtain support for them and are, are scientifically sound and uh, we have an ability to monitor them in the long term. The other threats uh, are, are perhaps outside of Alberta Environment Park's fishery management's control, but nonetheless are very important. So there are things like phosphorus and canal entrainment and dams and weirs and flows and about another, probably at least 25 factors that all act on the Bow River fish in some way. And we wanna to try to understand those. Um, and when we understand those, <clears throat> we will work um, collaboratively with those agencies and industries to try to identify management solutions that'll reduce those threats um, to the Bow River fishery. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Michael Sullivan, who will uh, guide us through some, some of the work that he's been, he's been helping us with on cumulative effects assessment. Hey, thanks, Paul. 
a good summary of a very large amount of work being done. Okay, this should be running up shortly. Good to go. There you Michael. go. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How can we help the Bow River? And I'll be talking about this recycle rate a fair bit. What I mean is, if there are 10 fish in the river and we catch 60, we've recycled those fish each six times. You'll see this term a fair bit tonight. It's how many times in a summer we're catching these trout. So quickly, what I'm gonna talk about today are the, the main cumulative effects we're finding out from this, uh, the Bow River study, the impacts or the, uh, the effect of the, the recycle rate, and really a plea at the end for help us out so we can figure out what to do about it. Boy, the bow is a busy place. Um, here's a fascinating map of Canada. Those red areas contain half the people in Canada. And the bow is right smack in that. So we know that there's more than just fishing going on to affect the Bow River. So this is just the initial stages of this uh, cumulative effects modeling that we're doing. And we're looking at a lot of different things, whirling disease and flow and uh, you know, road salt and stream temperature and bugs and birds. And the things in red are the things we're really focusing on um, in the last little while. And we looked at some of these things and we're just well below thresholds. Road salt, yeah, it's an issue, but not in the bow today these really weird um, rubber tire compounds that are affecting other rivers, not today. Pelican cormorants were well below the thresholds where we start to get a decline in fish population. Same with bug abundance. Uh, that didn't seem to be an issue. But a few of them were popping up as, yeah, on our first cuts, these things might be pretty important things. And the angling submodel, which I'm going to focus on today, is not the only thing we're looking at. It's stressor number six of an approximately 20, 25 stressor system. And typically when we do these cumulative effects modeling, we'll look at 20 or 30 effects and we'll find that two, three, four, rarely five are the drivers. It's not this great laundry list of 30 things. So on the bow, the initial likely main stressors seem to be flow issues, angling, and canal entrangement. And th those are just the initial ones that we're coming up with, but they seem to be pretty darn important for, for uh, causing effects on the fish population. So tonight we're just gonna focus in on the angling one. And there are a lot of anglers on the, on the bow. Um, a lot of this data is based on the 2018 information, but there are other sources we're using too. Basically I come up with how many anglers and how many fish are caught, when and where are they caught? And this gets complex really, quickly. If you think about it, we have four seasons on the bow. So uh, how many anglers? Well, you mean summer, fall, or winter. And we have five different river reaches that we've broken the bow into. We've got three types of fishermen. And I'll be describing this tonight and using sort of a shorthand form of, we have shore anglers, just guys fishing from recreation from shore. We have sport boat anglers, which are folks fishing from the drift boats and jet boats things. And we have commercial boats, and those are the guided boats. So you'll often hear me say shore, sport, and commercial. And those are the three types of fishermen. So if you ask, well, how many anglers? Well, <laughs> which season, which river reach, which type of angler? Summarizing it all together, there's about a quarter million hours were spent in 2018, about 62,000 days, catching about 63,000 rainbows. Out of a population of 13, maybe 15, uh, perhaps just recently up to 20,000 fish, but way more rainbows caught than fish. So when is angling pressure on the Bow River? Here's a quick graph to show you how complex even a simple question like that is. This is in the summertime, and this is the guided boat. This is the sport boat, and this is the shore anglers. So a heck of a lot of shore anglers in the summertime. Autumn time, way fewer. Winter time, diddly squat. And the highwood is sort of shorthand for that spring um, uh, fishery down on the highwood. So when is angling happening on the bow? It is overwhelmingly a summer and autumn fishery. 90% of the pressure happens in the summer and the fall, mostly in the summertime. How many person days? Well, the shore anglers are about 
42,000, guided boat 8,000, sport boat 12,000. That means that about of the 62,000 angler days, two thirds of the fishermen are shore anglers. And of the remaining 20,000 boats, about one in three of those is a guided boat, okay? So where and by who are the fish caught on the bow? Again, we have five sections of the river. The upper city, not many fish caught there. Lower city, a few more fish caught. It's really below the city, above and below McKinnon's, where we start to get the big thousands of fish being caught. So the catch by reach, it's clearly below the city. 65% um, of that catch is by boat anglers. And of those boat anglers, it's about a 55-45 split between the sport and the guide boats. So who's catching all the fish? Well, the shore anglers catch about 30% and the sport boat catch about 30% and the guided boat catch about 30%. So each of the types of anglers catches about a third of the fish, even though there's way more shore anglers and way fewer guides. About 53,000 of the 63,000 fish are caught in the summertime. Lots of fishing, not many fish. It's about 63,000 rainbows caught each year of a population that could be as low as 13,000. That means each rainbow is caught about five times a summer. If they wanna get big, they have to live through several summers that each fish could be caught a ridiculous number of times. That was based on the 2018 data. Uh, we know that the pressure was way up in 2020. It could have been higher, as high as six or seven. It's probably less in 21. There was fewer anglers um, fishing, open for summer, um, messed up for fall. That sort of meant that a lot of people went to BC or something, but we saw less pressure in 21 at most of the other lakes. And there was more fish. But still, five, six, seven times recycle rate is really high. Well, how many times can you <laughs> recycle a trout. You know, some of this information comes from Jim Stelfox's superb study for years on Quirk Creek, where it was a brook trout removal program, but we had lots of good data on catch and release on cutthroats for, for 15 plus years. And what we found there was when the recycle rate on the cuts was sort of between one and two, each fish was being caught once or twice a summer, there was no loss in the population, but there's no recovery either. That sort of stabilized it when the recycle rate was between one and two. Towards the end of the study, when the recycle rate went well below one, that's when we first started to see the inklings of a possible increase in big cuts. So recycle rate of one to two sort of stabilized it. Once we saw the recycle rate get down below one, we might've seen an increase. And that was with really good anglers. This is kind of what we saw in the Bow River back in the late 1980s when Al Soziak did that great work. Um, found that about uh, 40,000 fish were caught of populations that were estimated in a few earlier studies of around 30,000 fish. So back in the late 80s, the recycle rate on the bow was probably around 1.3. And remember the bow really didn't take off as a popular fishery. I, I remember fishing it with my dad in the late 70s. I was spending all my summer wages going to Russell Thornberry's shop and buying a sinking line that cost me about a month's worth of wages and going down and hardly anybody was fishing the bow in the late 70s. But it really started to take off in the early 80s. By the late 1980s, that recycle rate had gone up to 1.3, which we estimate is probably gonna just stabilize the fishery. So what do we want the recycle rate to be? Well, if it's over two, we're likely gonna see a decline and very few big fish. If we can get that down to one or two, it'll probably stabilize it. But if we can get it less than one or near one, it'll probably be increasing and more big fish. Those are the rules of thumb. We're at five. We got a lot of work to do to get that recycle rate down. So what do we do? Well, <laughs> what works? You know, we've come up with all these ideas in this science team, everything from July closures, August closures, weekday closures, special licenses, and we try to put numbers on what do you think a section closure below the city would do to the angler effort effect, but we really need more of these ideas and especially we need your opinions and advice. This is where we might be the fish science expert, but you guys are the fisheries experts. So things like um, the, the catch rate reduction, this is uh, things like if we go barbless, how many fewer fish might be caught? If we go to single lure or if we go to no weights or if we go to, you know, you have to get out of the boat to fish. 
we have all these ideas, but they're just draft ideas. You guys, tonight's audience includes some really true local experts that are really knowledgeable, efficient on the bow, and we need their advice. Um, hey, if we got a dozen of you guys in a room and said, if you guys could only fish dry fly and single, what would that drop the catch per unit effort by? 50%, 80%, 90%? Um, if we closed it on weekends, how often would you guys not go fishing? Would that drop fishing pressure by 50%? Um, the advice of you guys as local experts, plus the math that we have about catch and effort, I mean, that's a great hypothesis to test. That means we can put those test regulations in place and further using you local experts and citizen science projects to find out, are we actually getting those numbers that we expect? Or do people just learn how to fish dry fly and they start to get the recycle rate up again? So this is where we sort of fish science and fishing knowledge can really come together. We really need you guys because you're the experts. So we can run some initial scenarios. I can just run some scenarios about uh, how do we reduce the recycle rate? Well, let's close the Bow River until it recovers. That will work. Uh, we can close the Bow for three years. That will also work. We can close the summer and autumn fishery. We can close the July August fishery. These are draconian measures and they all have terrible consequences for the fishing, for the economy. The Bow River is an important fishery. But some of the modeling that we're doing suggests that really clever combinations of gear and access restrictions um, aren't going to get the recycle rate to zero, but it could still be effective. We can still get that recycle rate down to possibly near one. And some of those things are, well, handling techniques. People say, well, uh, make a rule so you don't hold the fish out of the water or you don't you know, photograph the fish for too long. Um, you hold a fish out of the raw water for much more than a minute and we really start to see the mortality rate go up. Uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, even 30 seconds is just fine. But holding it out for long is a bad idea. Holding it out for long in hot weather is a bad idea. These are just bad ideas that we should probably improve province-wide anyway. And maybe we'll be looking at things like... Uh, you know, like they're doing in Montana, hoot owl restrictions. It's getting warmer every single summer. Maybe we just put that east slopes wide. It's the things on the bow that we have to look at, things like the gear restrictions. And I'm not saying the way we fish on the bow now, where you're lobbing thingamabobbers with, you know, lines of Euro nymphs. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying that's unethical. I'm just saying it might be too darn effective for the current fishery we have right now. And maybe we need a period where, hey, we got to be less effective to get that recycle rate down for conservation to bring the bow back. And maybe that could be a selling feature. You know, the bow goes classic dry fishing for conservation. I'm not saying these things are unethical. I'm saying they're too effective for the conditions of the bow right now. As with access, maybe we have to look at, you know, shorter seasons in places or closing sections or a recovery rest period and things. The cool thing is these wise combinations of different gear restrictions, different access restrictions in our modeling seem to hold great promise in our conversations, in our back of the envelope math, but we really need your help to help us test some of these things out. So are these restrictions really necessary? Are the trout declining? Absolutely. The data shows a decline. Uh, how much a decline? We're not exactly sure. There's a lot of uncertainty, but yep, it's declining. Are the trout being overfished? Again, that recycle rate is really high and it's getting worse. Exactly how much? We're not sure. The risks, if we wait till all the uncertainty is gone, basically the fishery has to collapse to be certain. And then, there's gonna be even a bigger decline and harsher and longer restrictions. And think about it, if we're wrong and you guys do a bunch of really good conservation measures and it wasn't necessary, the trout get bigger and more abundant quicker. <laughs> you know, that's the downside. The fishing gets way better, way quicker if we're wrong. And remember the Bow River is this huge domino. There's 60,000 people fishing there. If it collapses because of our inaction, People are going to go to the crow, the old man, the ram, the cardinal. I mean, it could just be a domino across the whole east slopes. We can't let the bow fail. It is, it is part of Alberta's heritage, and man, it's a linchpin. And again, 
I've been talking tonight just about the angling submodel. Remember, typically we're looking at 30 different stressors. Initially, the main stressors are things like flow, angling, canal entrainment, and we will be working on those. But you guys are the passionate people, the passionate anglers that can help us out with one of the big likely stressors, angling. So just in summary, hey, the trout are declining. The major stressors include angling. That recycle rate is really high. Look at the face of a Bow River rainbow. You can see it's being caught multiple times. Can we get that down? We need to get that recycle rate way down if we want to meet our objective of true blue ribbon fishery. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, hi. Masi Cho. Back to you, Paul. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, oh. Do you want me to not want to put that back up? Uh, if you can. Did I? Uh, I can probably restyle here a little bit. No, I can just hear Janine getting upset at our incompetence. My incompetence, sorry. We even we were even coached on this too. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, we are uncoachable. How's that? Perfect. Thank you, Mike. Um, so, <clears throat> I I think there's a few things that we'd like to leave you with for tonight. Um, but our next steps are are to to continue to share information on the Bow River fishery, uh, to continue to build the cumulative effects model, like. Mike said, um, we're engaging with you folks tonight because you've identified uh, yourselves as anglers and uh, we like to talk to the anglers about angling regulations and monitoring of fish populations as well. I, I think the other few things I'd like to leave you with is, is, uh, is I'd like to thank a number of individuals uh, that are probably present on this call tonight for, for pushing us to, to, to look at this more significantly. And I'd like you to know that, that your words have resonated. Um, I hope you can see by the makeup of our, of our panel, uh, the depth and breadth of experience that we've brought to this table, um, that the Bow River <clears throat> is not just Alberta's most popular fishery, but it is, it's a very important fishery that is going to receive sustained attention in, in the coming years. So, this is not something where you might just expect to see a presentation on the Bow River and then you go away for a few years. Uh, this is something you can expect to see a, um, more information come out on and, and we do really want to hear your feedback. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. So we'll move into the Q&A here. Thanks, Michael, for sharing your screen. You can now stop sharing your screen if you'd like. <laughs> So I'll invite the panel to join us so we can uh, turn our videos back on. Um, so just a reminder to folks that we've got um, two of my coworkers here, Alyssa and Jenna, who are going to be working in the background, who are going to be making sure that everything is running smoothly technically for us. Um, so they're not going to turn their video on and they're not going to be um, responding to anything that's coming in on the panel. And so I see lots of great questions coming in. So it looks like everybody's found that Q&A uh, button or tool that we're gonna be using tonight. So that's uh, really great to see. So while you're typing your questions in there or upvoting things that you'd like to see, we are gonna start off with a few pre-submitted questions. Um, so the first one comes from Dave and Dave is wondering, are the fish populations harmed by the recent flow instabilities? Yeah, thanks, Janine. Um, I guess maybe I'll take that, being the environmental flow specialist. Uh, I, I guess maybe to start off that question, I'll say there's, there's been quite a bit of work that's looked at um, the effects of both flow management and other human stressors on the Bow River over the last century, um, especially work done by the uh, University of Calgary and University of Lethbridge that has, um, you know, documented changes to both fish communities and other ecosystem components from, <clears throat> from flow management as, as well as those other human stressors. 
however, I think this question is more related to, uh, I'm assuming it's, it's related to changes to uh, operation of the Ghost Reservoir in 2015 as uh, a means to mitigate uh, flood risk on, on, on uh, for the city of Calgary. And uh, our, our hydrologist in AP actually <clears throat> did a, uh, quite a detailed um, look into potential changes to uh, flow in, in, in the Bow River um, <clears throat> uh, downstream from both Ghost Reservoir and downstream of, of, of Bear Spa. Uh, they actually given that presentation to a number of stakeholder groups and it's quite an interesting and detailed presentation so i'm not going to go through that whole presentation tonight obviously and, and uh, kind of give you the very summarized cold notes uh, at a at a scale of days to weeks to months um, <clears throat> the effects of um, uh, the, the, the change in reservoir operations for, for flood mitigation hasn't um, hasn't shown up in in the hydrology much, much of the change in hydrology that we've seen over the last five years on those longer time scales of days to weeks to, to months has been driven by climatic variability um, however on shorter time scale at, at, on the order of hours to a day uh, there have been operational changes that have, have affected um, the flows in the river, most notably through, you know, rapid uh, um, drawdown events. And uh, so we have looked at those. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Lauren McAwicki, um, she did a re really great uh, review, both of the science literature, but of also other jurisdictions that have looked at drawdown effects on, on fish communities. And, and, you know, obviously there's um, a, a lot of variation in, in in the effects of those drawdown rates, but there are some rules of thumbs that other jurisdictions have used. Um, one of them being, you know, if, if those drawdown events are, are greater than about 10 centimeters per hour, then the effects on, on, on fish and other aquatic uh, communities can be quite, uh, start become quite more, quite, quite more severe. Uh, on, on the Bow River and through, through Calgary or, or below Bear Spa, below the Ghost Reservoir, we do see those kinds of um, drawdown events periodically through, through the open water period. Uh, they, so they've occurred since um, flood mitigation since 2015, but those events have also occurred prior to 2015 as well. And again, it's related to, um, it can be related to, 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 to changes in, sudden changes in operation of, of, of um, upstream reservoirs and dams. In, in contrast, if we look at uh, the Highwood River, for example, and look at these kinds of drawdown of events on the Highwood River, we rarely see uh, a drawdown that would, ex uh, a, a change in flow that would ex exceed 10 centimeters per hour uh, on the Highwood. So it is, um, you know, uh, likely of an anthropogenic signals from from regulation being one of those, those causes. And like, as I said, those have been shown in other jurisdictions to, to affect fish. So uh, yes, those, those kinds of instabilities can affect fish populations. Um, they have occurred in the last five years since um, flood mitigation, but they also have shown up in, in the past as well. And is my, in Mike's presentation, sort of some of those flow effects that we've been talking about, um, that is one of them that uh, appears to um, be, have potential to, to be affecting fish populations. Great, thanks, Andy. So I have another um, pre-submitted question here, and I see we've already got another live question about it. So I'm just going to combine the two of them together. So our pre-submitted question comes from Dinos. And Dinos is wondering, why can we not stock the Bow River with browns and rainbows, um, like 500,000 of them in an area and not just six inches? And then we have a live question from Jeff tonight who says, have you considered supplementing the trout population by stocking the river? Uh, hi, everyone. I can, uh, I can talk, speak to this. Uh, thank you, Dinos, for the, for the question. Um, I know this is a, a popular uh, topic and question that we that we get often, and we could probably have a whole separate uh, session on on the topic of stocking. But I'll try to be a little more concise than that. So, stocking is a management tool that we that we do have. We use it um, in the province already. It can be used to create angling or harvest opportunities. Uh, most common example of this is probably our our um, 
number of trout put and take fisheries. Uh, we can also use it as a restoration tool in cer certain circumstances. And we're actually piloting this with some species at risk in the upper old man watershed. There are some considerations with, uh, with stocking. So, you know, first it, it doesn't fix or compensate for any other issues that might be going on in a fishery or that might be affecting a fishery. So identifying those, those primary th threats are, are key. Um, and Mike spoke uh, lots about that tonight about identifying some of those, those threats and stressors. There's also a um, considerable amount of evidence to indicate that stocking of, of hatchery fish um, over top of a naturally reproducing or self-sustaining uh, fish population can, can have negative ecological um, impacts in some instances. There was um, a pivotal study on the Madison River in the late uh, the late 60s, early 70s, that was one of the first studies to, to sort of look at this and to show that the stocking of, of hatchery fish um, on top of wild trout actually did cause a decline in the abundance. And that sort of caused a, a bit of a shift, a paradigm shift when it comes to stocking, particularly um, considerations of stocking in flowing waters. Um, and it kicked off a, a large body of research on um, hatchery and stocking techniques and improvements and, and all those, those sorts of things. So uh, there's definitely instances where stocking can be effective. Um, for example, where there are recruitment issues, so where there are very few baby fish um, or places where there isn't a self-sustaining population. So it can be used to sort of get a population started. Um, and, you know, this is, this is one of the working hypotheses for the, for the bow of why the initial stockings of rainbows and browns were so successful, um, you know, following the declines of some of the native trout species like cutthroat and, and bulls. Um, but on the bow, we don't, we don't seem to have a baby fish problem. You'll remember that bubble plot that Paul showed and talked about earlier. Um, there was some of those smaller size classes that we've been seeing um, and recruiting into the fishery. So this is indicating that um, maybe producing baby fish isn't, um, isn't a, a big issue on, on the bow. So um, all of that is a bit of a long-winded response to sort of say stocking isn't a one size fits all strategy. It does have risks that we would want to consider, um, you know, if we're talking about this for, for the bow. Um, but, but what we can do is within, you know, the model frameworks that Paul and Mike described and, and some of the ongoing population demographic work that we're doing on, on the Bow River is we can explore stocking as a, as a tool for the bow, keeping in mind some of those considerations that I, that I mentioned earlier. So uh, I hope that sort of helps put stocking in the bow and into a bit of context. Great, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Michael's giving you a thumbs up, so good answer. <laughs> um, so our next pre-submitted question comes from Michael, and it's actually a bit of a three-prong question. And we have a bunch of other questions that have already come in and been upvoted that are on the same topic. So I'll read out Michael's question, and then I'll read out the other two that are in relation to it. So Michael's pre-submitted question was, wouldn't a trophy fishery be further enhanced by a closed winter season, a barbless hook mandate, and high temperature closures? And so we've also got another question that came in live from Brandon who says, um, what is the specific criteria for fishery closures in hot weather periods? Our river needs to be protected, especially during hot times of hot weather. And then we've also got another question about barbless hooks saying, what is the status of switching Alberta as a whole to barbless hooks, similar to BC restrictions? So lots there for the panel. Maybe let's start with the closing of the winter season as the first part, and then we can go into the barbless and the high temp part. Uh, sure. Thanks, Janine. I'll, I'll, I'll answer uh, some of the aspects, and then I'll, I'll call on my colleague Shane uh, to provide kind of a policy level provincial perspective, maybe on some of the gear related changes. Uh, so those are, those are really good questions, and we get the question of winter closure all the time. Um, uh, and not just winter closure, but spring spawning closures. Maybe we should look at a spring highwood spawning closure. Unlike a lot of um, things where, where we don't actually have really good data, this is one thing we have uh, very good data on. My predecessor uh, did his graduate work on spawning closures on the Highwood River. Um, the thought 
<clears throat> was that if we closed the, the Highwood River spawning run to fish, that that would be much better for the fishery because the hypothesis was is that they would experience very high mortality while being caught on their spawning runs. Primarily due to the very cold water temperatures that are present at the time of spring spawning around four degrees Celsius, uh, mortality was almost zero. I think it was on the order of about a half a percent or maybe slightly more than that. So when we zoom out to look at the cumulative effects model, um, if we look at Mike's graphs about um, when, when all the effort occurs, really the winter and spring part of the fishery is a, a very, very small portion of the effort. And if we take that effort multiplied by a very small mortality rate, really, um, you know, it, it does look like it's going to be a really effective regulation but a small number of caught fish multiplied by a small mortality rate really doesn't get us the kind of savings that we need to really move the needle on that Bow River fishery. So it's a really good question, but until you consider it a little bit more uh, in a fulsome way in a cumulative effects context, it's hard to understand why closing it for the winter maybe isn't the most effective lever. Uh, I, I guess the next thing I'll start to address is, is some of the barbless hook, uh, the barbless hook issue. So one thing, um, you know, this has been a very interesting topic for fishery managers across the globe. This is not just an Alberta thing. Uh, and, and I think what's been found is for the most part, implementation of barbless hooks has not been shown to really decrease the mortality rates of, of caught fish. So this is another regulation where, you know, if the, if the change in mortality is a percent or less, if we're needing to really reduce recycle rate or mortality rates by several dozen percent, but we can only achieve maybe 1% or less with, with barbless rates, we have to ask ourselves whether or not that's the most effective type, type of regulation. Now, there may be other reasons why, why we want to do that. Uh, maybe, maybe injury rates are lower. Um, but at the end of the day, I think anglers have, have choices that they can make where they can, can decide to use barbless hooks uh, as a means to, you know, to either reduce their handling time or, or, or catch rates. There are also some, some complications. I know we have re received this feedback a lot in the past um, where people would have really challenged us to try to reinstate barbless hook regulations. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that Alberta is not taking that off the table, but it's uh, a little bit more complicated than us just changing the regulation back. And, and I'll maybe invite Shane to the discussion to explain some of the, some of the, uh, the federal policy uh, changes that are required to help um, implement barbless or even other type of gear related changes. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, that was that was a great uh, summary, actually, of you know one of the components that we would consider when we're looking at uh, um, trying to make improvements to fisheries, whether it's mortality or or whatever the case might be. And that's that's is it going to work from a management perspective? Um, so that was great. And and but when the the other aspect is is in Alberta, um, we generally are able to make um, annual regulation changes for most things relative to fisheries uh, within the department that we work. So, so Alberta Environment and Parks has the ability just using variation orders, uh, kind of order and council stuff to change angling regulations, uh, most of the angling regulations that we, we would change. So fisheries closures, possession amounts, uh, going to catch and release, those types of things. There are other regulations uh, and, and barbless hooks and, and, and gear restrictions are one of them that are still closely linked to the Federal Fisheries Act. So if you think of the relationship between Alberta and the Federal Fisheries Act, there is a set of Alberta regulations that, under, that are under the Federal Fisheries Act. And there are certain components of that for which they give us the authority to make regulations uh, on an annual basis through a variation order, but there are other ones like gear restrictions that we have to actually engage our federal colleagues and, and typically to engage them on these processes is probably about an 18 to you know 24 month process to because they have a 
protracted uh, uh, timeline, I guess, uh, you know, they have a lot of things going on. So it does take a long time for us to get through uh, with working with our federal colleagues to make single, uh, you know, simple, what we would view as simple changes or what we would consider to be likely simple changes. So, so that's some of the hurdles we have uh, when, we, when we are considering certain uh, angling regulation changes. Now, I mean, that said, those are in our toolbox. We would have the ability to make those changes. There are just some, some time considerations for it. Um, I'll also add that, you know, we have been in discussion since, since I kind of came into this role, you know, probably roughly about six months now, I did initiate discussions with the, with the federal government, with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, um, really to, to, to look at the entire suite of uh, Federal Fisheries Act um, schedules and give us authority to make simple regulation changes uh, within Alberta and not having to go through that 18 to 24 month process. So, so we are working with them to try and come up with ways that we can uh, manage fisheries more effectively and, and, and certainly uh, on, you know, make regulation changes on an annual basis as opposed to going through, uh, you know, uh, up to a two year process with the federal, our federal partners. And, I, you know, I would, I would say that, um, we don't have, and, and Paul kind of mentioned this as well, we don't really have an approach where we've defined, uh, we, where we are pursuing uh, an Alberta-wide barbless hook regulation at this point. Thanks, Shane. Um, did you also want to speak to the third part of the question, um, just about the specific criteria for the fish oh, closure in hot sure. weather periods? Sure. Uh, yeah, and I'll, and Mike, you can feel it to, feel free to jump in here as well at some point. I guess we... There's, this this is the complicated one. Um, we I guess there are when there are no hard criteria under which we would say that's it the fisheries closed. We don't have that. It's not a set annual thing where we reach a certain flow temperature and you know uh, other considerations where we uh, just close the fishery to anglers uh, uh, for some period of time. Uh, we take the approach that, I mean, it, it's complicated in the sense that, um, you know, it is an interaction between low flows, high temperatures, and anglers, angling. And uh, if we decide to uh, make closures, and, and Mike kind of spoke to a, a bunch of these things in his talk, things like, okay, if we close the Bow River, um, where does everybody go fishing? Do they move to the Ram? Do they move to the Upper Old Man? Do the Livingston? To the Crow? Uh, you know, we would see a shift in angling pressure to other places that would probably be uh, in, in the same position, you know, likely be in, in a similar position in terms of high temperatures, low flow and, and, and increased anglers. So we don't have any hard criteria. We, we have taken, we are looking at it and, and we are considering various things, but it has to be at a scale that's manageable. Uh, it, it wouldn't be at a scale where we would be turning fisheries on and off every year in, in terms of, uh, you know, issuing variation orders and then going through all of the steps that would uh, be necessary to inform the public that these fisheries are now closed to recreational angling. Um, so we're, we're considering other things like perhaps some hoot owl or time of day closures. And those would be things that, uh, you know, they would be implemented at a certain scope and scale across, you know, ES1 and maybe portions of ES2. Uh, but and we would look to have those in place every year. You know, it might be something that starts July 1st and ends, you know, August 31st or whatever the case might be. Uh, and so we are considering those approaches. And you'll probably hear more about that when we go come into our, our January engagements, uh, more that is on our reg regulation cycle change uh, uh, engagements. Uh, but right now, I, you know, we don't have anything hard and fast. Yeah, I think I would just add to that, Shane, that as I said in the presentation, things like the barbless change the needle a little bit. Things like the Hoodell regulations, those are good ethical things, but it just changes the needle a little bit. We're catching each fish four, five, six, possibly seven times. We've got to get that way down. Tweaking the regs isn't going to get us out of this issue. Nonetheless, things like barbless and hoot owls might be just darn good ethical things we should be doing anyway at most of the rivers, but it's not going to solve the Bow River problem. A different conversation. Great. Thanks, Michael and Shane. So our next question here comes from Brent, and Brent is wondering, do you have any of, or sorry, any day of the week usage stats? Yeah, I can take that. We have it for the Bow River uh, and for most of our fisheries 
Absolutely. <laughs> Weekends have a certain amount of pressure and weekdays have about the same amount of pressure, but it's spread out over five days. Using that as a lever, hey, let's close Tuesdays. That's the biggest day of the week. People will just go to Wednesdays or the Mondays. We'll just be moving people around. So we have the data, but it's not going to be a just tweaking, as I said in the last question, just tweaking a small regulation to get this recycle rate way down. So yeah, we have day of the use, day of the week use information. Not sure it's that useful of a regulation tool. Big chunks, close it on weekends. That might do something. But again, as Shane said, does everybody then go to the old man? The racers creek get nailed? Does the ram get nailed? These are big issues. So we got to be really careful about uh, hey, let's just close the bow for a little while and then Kiss the Cardinal goodbye. <laughs> Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of questions about all the other fish. So what about the brown trout and the pike and the white fish? So um, I'll group them all together here. So first one is from Jim, just wondering what the status of brown trout population. Is there data around brown trout population in the Bow River or other species? Uh, what is the status of brown trout in the Bow River? Is there a similar declining population trend? And then looking for any other info about any of the other fish in the bow, including the pike, the Rockies, and the whitefish population. Okay, uh, yeah, those are really good. Those are really good questions. <clears throat> um, one thing that can be a little challenging as a, as a fisheries manager when we're doing surveys is to try to focus on every single thing while trying to maintain our focus on another thing. So <clears throat> we've we've kind of shifted our approaches over the years from we just kind of net everything and, and try to understand everything at the same time, or focus our effort on something like the rainbow trout. For rainbow trout, um, that's the focal management species for the Bow River. What we like to say is the other fish come along for the ride. We're not doing things that we anticipate would, would result in benefits to brown or to rainbow trout that would not also benefit brown trout and mountain whitefish. Um, but it can be very challenging to try to understand everything because what we found is by trying to understand everything, uh, we don't have a focus on anything. <laughs> so um, what we think we do is have a pretty good idea of what's going on with the rainbow trout populations. And because brown trout are just less abundant than rainbow trout in the population, they're a lot harder to get recaptures of. So we do we do still capture the data, um, and we do you know we do have that available in our in our FWIMIS, uh, database, which is public access data. Um, but when we try to run recapture rates on brown trout, the, the confidence intervals are so broad that they don't they aren't really as informative as we'd hope they'd be. Our best guess is that brown trout are fairly stable. They're not experiencing the, the major ups and downs that, that rainbow trout are. They're, you know, they're about the same as they've always been. Uh, we do also find the odd pike and the odd bull trout. Uh, I did see another question uh, down about bull trout as well. I'll maybe try to kind of blend an answer in with that one. Um, According to our surveys, you know, while you as an angler may actually see a couple more bull trout because you caught some more at a population scale, we really don't get that many bull trout. If we get one or two a year, that's, you know, that's about what we consistently see. So I don't think we would say that bull trout are going up or down. Uh, bull trout are, they're present in the system. They likely drop out of the high wood and there may be some individuals that carry out their their entire life history in the bow but for the most part our, our studies are geared to best understand rainbow trout um, but we we do also capture data on the other ones but our understanding of those ones is, is not nearly as as uh, as good as rainbows maybe i'll just add to that then so that that was great paul um uh for, for both brown trout and, and mountain whitefish, it's it's not that we don't try and net them when we're on the boat. Then the folks are are capturing them. They are they do get enumerated. Uh, when we use our population estimate data, it gives us an idea of 
how efficient are we at capturing different species? Um, <clears throat> brown trout, mountain mount whitefish, we are just not as efficient at catching them as, as rainbow, rainbow trout. For rainbow trout, we're somewhere around catching about five to 10% of, of the actual fish that are in the river at that location. Uh, so for mountain whitefish, we're, we're, we're lower in those, uh, those numbers. So what that means is uh, as we try to pick our ability to pick out actual true trends in the data through time will be much harder to do. The variance in the data will be larger. It'll be harder to pick out trends, but we can still look at the data and, and, and we, we do have those plots and have looked at them. Uh, and as, as Paul said, our indication is that, is that for both brown trout and mountain whitefish populations have remained um, relatively stable over that period of time. But again, with, it's with that giant caveat our ability to detect trend, trend, it's gonna to have to be a very strong trend for us to be able to detect it through, through time. So we're not seeing it, that's good news, um, uh, but uh, we don't have a, a fine tweezer on, on those populations to understand them. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Mark, who says the current regulations are difficult to enforce consistency because of lack of officers. How would new gear restrictions be enforced without more funding for enforcement? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, that's a great question. Um, we do know that with enforcement, uh, we do uh, enforcement or any regulation change or you, you, there's, a, there's a, a transition time time or a trend, uh, uh, time for which it takes uh, for to get that regulation out, out to folks. So most regulation changes start with a, with a, a cycle of, of, of education. Let, let folks know, hey, this is what we're thinking of. This is, and this is what's going to be implemented. It gives uh, anglers uh, time and space to make some of the necessary changes. From the, from a enforcement standpoint, we work closely with our enforcement officers. Uh, uh, they gen generate a significant amount of uh, enforcement checks or contacts with with Alberta anglers, on, especially on the Bow River downstream of Calgary. So it, it already is a um, high contact area. As far as um, uh, as these gear restrictions come into effect, um, we, we still see, we still rely largely on, on the eyes and ears of the anglers on, on the river and use through use of the, uh, the report approach or program just to, to let um, the public and I, those that are out there uh, report those activities that, um, that uh, are, are, are illegal or are currently against the regulations. So it's kind of a three-tiered uh, approach is education. Uh, second is, is, is contact with that, that the, uh, fr from the officers. And then lastly, relying on the eyes and ears of the, of the England community out there. Um, thank you for your question. I do appreciate it. Thanks. Stuart, Stuart, if I could add a little bit to that. You bet. The Bow River is almost a, a blue ribbon example of how the anglers have helped with the enforcement. Yeah. Back when it was still a harvest, the ethical change was to go to catch and release, and the anglers led that. The report of poacher for the gear restriction of no bait on the bow, that was really heavily done by anglers phoning in and using the report of poacher line. So exactly what Stuart says, and I think the Bow River community of fishermen have been leading Alberta in that terms of virtually self-enforcement. So, so the Bow is the best case we have of, you guys are doing a hell of a good job. Keep it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Great, thanks you guys. Our next question comes from John and John is wondering, is there an ETA on identification of the other stressors and a preliminary plan to work on the other stressors? Uh, yeah, th uh, thanks for the question, John. Um, I appreciate the, the, the question. I, I know you and I have spoken offline and. And, and I always appreciate that, that, uh, that we're being challenged to move quickly on some of these things. Um, as I kind of put in, in, my, uh, in my presentation, I, I think our realistic timeline to start to look at uh, some of the other cumulative effects is about April, 2022. Um, <clears throat> we really want to thoroughly um, 
thoroughly get a handle and do a good job on the angling engagement stuff. I think that is going to take us a period of time. And it was recommended to us by the science team that um, while they were interested and appreciated all the work that was being done on the, on the cumulative effects assessment, they felt given Alberta Environment Parks' focus and regulatory mandate to, to, to do angling regulations that we should put more of our focus on that and reconcile a lot of those issues. So it is on the plan. Um, we are going to be looking at it in, in probably early next fiscal. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. So just to add to that, um, it, it's also a, um, the stressors, uh, because this is a, a modeling tool, um, it, it is a, it's on a continuous improvement cycle. There's always new and better information available. And as that information becomes uh, available, it'll be, we'll, we'll update the tool accordingly. So not only are we constantly, uh, or we'll be adding, uh, uh, adding to the model, or, or to the tool, but we'll also be also updating the tool as as new information becomes available. So, and, and that's just that's just our best uh, best practice. Thank you. Great, thanks, you guys. Our next question comes from Peter, and Peter says the Bow River is no longer a dry fly fishery. Is a single fly or lure a realistic alternative? Thank, thank you, Peter, for for that uh, question. I think the uh, in in Mike's presentation, the idea of putting uh, dry fly uh, as a dry fly fishery was was just to stimulate uh, the conversation to put that as out there as a possibility of of something that might that we might uh, that may achieve uh, some of the outcomes that we're after. Um, it, it's it's a great question, and again, why we are committed to to coming back to the anglers with some of these thoughts before we 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 bring them out as regulations. So there'll be a lot more conversation before anything like that would come into yeah, uh, come to come into effect. But thank you for your question. Yeah, just just to add to that, Peter. Remember, the objective is to reduce the number of fish you catch. So if you now catch five fish. We want to reduce that to one. What you just said, the bow is no longer dry fly fishery, sounds like that's a good rule. <laughs> if it's not a dry fly fishery, you'll catch way fewer fish. Remember, if you can catch five now, what do we have to do to make you only catch one? It's going to be harsh. That's what I mean. These aren't simple restrictions. These are effective restrictions. Great. Thanks, you guys. We have two questions that uh, we're going to join together here about the Highwood. So um, we'll just link them two together. So the first one comes from Jim and Jim is wondering if recruitment is strong, are the juvenile rainbows dying in the Highwood system en route from Highwood to the bow or after they arrive in the bow? And a similar question from Brett saying, has closing sections like the Highwood confluence for spring to protect the staging rainbows been considered. It would drop the recycle number, I'm sure being that these few hundred fish get caught multiple times in that short pre-period, short period pre-spawn. <laughs> Maybe I can take the first part of that question, uh, Paul, and that's the uh, <clears throat> recruitment strong, where do we think things might be getting lost? So. Uh, I know I'm not allowed to go back and show slides and do that kind of thing. So you're going to have to pull up the bubble plot in your mind or, or look at the YouTube uh, video again. Um, but in that plot, Paul showed the smallest sizes of rainbow trout we actually don't see in, in the Bow River very much at, at, at all. Part of that's because our electrofishing boat's not very good at sampling really small, small fish. Um, but we believe the other factor is, is that those, those, those would represent the young of year um, uh, rainbow trout is that potentially many of those fish are still in, in the Highwood River, haven't moved out. What we are seeing is that next age class, um, kind of the 150 millimeter size fish, which are the age ones, we see those in, in the electrofishing cats uh, start showing up quite strongly. So what that's um, uh, telling us is that we're, we're getting good recruitment in the Highwood River. Those fish are moving in, into the Bow River. We're seeing them as one-year-olds in the Bow River. 
uh, as they grow older in the Bow River, um, that's where they're that that's where they're dying. They're 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 dying post age, age one as, as as they get get older. I mean, natural mortality is going to occur with any fish fish species. That's a, a a normal process, and it's just a matter of how much additional mortality is being added to that. Okay, and, and I can I can answer the second part of that one. Uh, I I I think I, I touched a little bit on on this one before. Uh, has closing sections like the highway confluence to protect been considered? So <clears throat> that actually was the focal question uh, that that resulted in in my my uh, previous supervisor uh, doing their master's master's thesis on uh, to answer that exact question. So. Uh, that hypothesis was raised. If we close the high wood, um, surely um, reducing the catch or eliminating that catch would would be a really good thing. Um, so <clears throat> what they what what they did during that study was was they um, involved a bunch of citizen science anglers and they and they caught those fish with rod and reel and they put them in in net pens and observed what the mortality looked like. And uh, and the mortality was 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 very very low. Uh, it was about a half a percent. So even though those fish got caught uh, quite a few times, uh, probably the mechanism behind why they weren't dying is is water temperatures are very very low. Um, so you know what when you have uh, very low mortality rates times not that many fish, you know. It's uh, it's not going to result in the types of savings that that we need to talk about, and that's not to say that um, you know, giving fish a break during that time isn't a good thing to do ethically, but as population managers looking at the scale of the Lower Bow River, that's probably not a large enough lever that is something that we would be able to detect and would result in the type of recovery that um, that I, I think we're looking uh, to get here. Thanks for the question. Great, thanks, Paul and Andy. Our next question comes from Alan, who says, the Elk River in BC is also heavily fished. Cutthroat trout are so easy to catch, yet these fish seem to be very abundant and large. Are you sure that the Stelfox Quirk Creek criteria of approximately one is applicable? So, so I might also invite uh, some of my other colleagues that, that might be able to supplement my answer. Um, I don't think we've looked at population data from the Elk River. So I, you know, I, I've heard the same stories. I, I've experienced the same type of fishing on some of these Southern BC cutthroat streams. You can catch lots of fish and they're really big fish. But what I think we would really have to ask ourselves is what proportion of the population are being caught? Um, and we just don't have a good way of knowing that um, without looking into some of the population population data specifics. Uh, yeah, I, anyone want to supplement that? Well, yeah, to some degree, you say the fish are abundant in the elk. There's part of your answer. If they're really abundant, it means there's a lots of fish on that denominator. We have to ask then, does the elk have the kind of fishing pressure the bow has? And remember, a recycle rate of one means each fish gets caught once. Are there as many people on the elk as there are cutthroat? Probably not, without knowing how many people are on the, on the elk. I've never seen a creel survey done on that, but be careful of that. What you say are, what we say are, wow, that's a lot of anglers. I, I, we used to say that about the Bow River when it was so empty in the 1970s. And then, oh my God, look at all the people in the late 1980s. That was sustainable. Is the elk equal to the bow in pressure? I don't know. It would have to be more than the bow because the cutthroat are so more, more abundant. Two parts of the question, how many people, how many fish? If the fish are abundant, you, need, you can support even more people. Great, thank you. The next question comes from Jim, who says the Cahill study suggests a decline in rainbow population from 2003 to 2013, yet the fact sheet graph seems to show an increase. Clarification or correction? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, clarification on, on that one in, in that uh, the, the Cahill paper is, uh, is showing population estimates and and the fact sheet and, and, and Paul's presentation was using K 
catch rates. Um, that probably doesn't mean anything to anyone except for a, a few people on this panel and, and, and myself. Um, so to, to explain or to make, try to explain most simply, by doing the population estimates, you're correcting for differences in the catchability of the boat when it's out there fishing. So it, uh, you can imagine in some years, maybe it's uh, lower water, a better driver of the boat, better netters, they might have a higher efficiency. Um, so they catch lots of fish. That doesn't mean there's more fish in, in, in the water. Our population estimates account for that. Um, the fact sheets in Paul's presentation that he showed today in order to get the 2021 data on there, we, we just use catch rates that doesn't account for that, those differences in, in, in catchability uh, in order to present the data today. We'll, we will be doing that. Uh, we will be doing the population estimates to make it more uh, to make it comparable apples to apples um, to the to, to the uh, uh, 2018 study um, by, by by Chris as well as many of us on the call here as well. I, I, and one other thing on on that that graph, the 2013 point in in our our 2018 paper, uh, it didn't include um, population estimate that was done. The data for that one 2013 point. Uh, which is quite low and it's not driving the trend, but it, it kind of shows up in the figures being um, uh, kind of an a, anomaly low point. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like, oh, that must be because of the flood or something else. That is just from sites that are very near to the Harvey Passage. So uh, as we consider the Lower Bow River uh, farther upstream for, for the Lower Bow River, where we know populations of rainbow aren't that abundant. So that 2013 point in our 2018 paper is an anomalous uh, uh, data point when you're just uh, because of spatial var variation. But even when you take that point out of the uh, of that paper, the the the, the trend is, is still there. And even with our catch per unit effort data that we showed today, um, again because it doesn't control for catch uh, this catchability, it means the variance is going to be greater. But when we look at the trend over. Uh, uh, that 20 year period, 2003 to 2020, 2020, not including the 21 point where it looks like there might be an increase. But if we look at 03 to 2020, we get the same annual decline of about 6% decline in the population per year. Um, that was uh, in the Cahill um, 2018 paper. So similar, similar pattern, but, but excellent question. And uh, uh, obviously someone was paying attention to presentations. Thanks, Andy. All right, so our next uh, question comes from Michael. So it's a bit of a long one, so bear with me. Michael says, thanks for engaging us on this important topic. Angling pressure and catch damage is pretty evident to anyone who fishes on the bow on the regular basis. Considering conservation-based regulations is an excellent idea. Single barbless fly only, no artificial weights, stronger seasonal regulations like spawning closures, winter closures, high temp closures, would all go a long way while still being protective of commercial guiding and of recreational anglers. Is AEP prepared to put some of these measures discussed today in place for the 2022-23 angling season? And could specific reaches where recycle rates of trout are highest be preferentially targeted to test the efficacy of these kinds of regs? Thank you, Michael, for your uh, for your question. Um, I think the, the the biggest thing out of that is tonight's session is, is basically to, uh, to 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 talk to anglers about some of the things that we're finding uh, and and share information. And the the intent is to then generate some ideas uh, and 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 what will work. Um, I think what you will also see is uh, some focus sessions as to what are the possibilities, what what are things that we can be doing, and test those in our model to see what what effectiveness they they will uh, will actually have. Um, the uh, I do uh, as far as uh, for the 2022-23 season. I think one of the things you you will see is uh, in increase in education uh, of of the, of the angling community as to hey this is what we're thinking about uh, a time to test reaction time to uh, uh, get preparation uh, to, to to that that there there are changes expected and and coming. 
Um, the, and then the last thing, because specific reaches where cycle rates of trout are highest be pre preferential, uh, preferentially targeted. One of the things that we do always strive, uh, we, uh, strive for in our regulation, and, and some of it has to do with some of the enforceability, is to make sure that we, we do have uh, ease, of, of, uh, ease of regulations for, for anglers so that we're not changing uh, regulations throughout it. Uh, and that, that's what, one thing we've heard loud and clear from our England community is, is, is they do want to see a, a very uh, 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 a, a simplistic or, uh, and consistent regulations uh, so that we're, there, there's not a constant uh, change from water body to water body. So it's, a, it's something to consider it's, and we do appreciate the feedback. And maybe maybe I'll supplement that a little bit from the biological side. I think I think you covered the the, the reg simplicity aspect uh, very nicely, um, Stuart. The, you know that was a specific objective when we did the 2015 reg change was to align things into a, something that was easily under, enforceable and understood. Um, <clears throat> with respect to to how we look at it biologically. It would be very difficult to, uh, you know, in a reach like the Lower Bow River, to implement um, a set of these regulations in one portion of that stream and then not in another, because those reaches are connected and, and the fish, you know, they fish throughout the reach. It would be very difficult to disentangle whether or not that regulation was effective, and and I think that's a big part of what this is as well. We don't have all the answers right now for what will work. We have strong ideas and hypotheses, but fundamental and key to, to some of this work is in addition to making the change is to monitor the population and see whether or not it was effective. And to do that, we'd have to have you know very discrete study reaches where we're not combining different management actions in the same reach. But but it's it's a it's a great suggestion and a good question. Thank you. I'm just gonna jump in there too. I, I, it's a, uh, yeah, a great, great discussion on that one. And um, uh, this idea of having different, different reaches to, to, to look at it is, is, is an interesting idea. And, um, uh, there's other ways we could look at it too, is that, that you could have different groups of anglers out there uh, using different techniques to get at some of these things. So I think there's some uh, potential a real good potential for citizen science uh, in, in, in this program and um, we're kind of piloting a, a, a program this or just finished it I guess this this fall where a pit tag fish from uh, from our population estimates in in September we combined with a, a number of folks um, carrying these readers to, to find out if they caught one of these tag fish which actually can give us a direct measurement of, of recycle rates. Um, we've got to look at how fish are moving and, and a few things to consider. So it's a real it, kind of the pilot stage, I would say this, this fall, but if that proves to be uh, uh, successful and, and useful, um, there are ways to use that kind of technique to send out one group of people with a certain type of regulation or lure type or whatever and another group with with another and 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 look at how their recycle rates rates differ i i you know i'm getting a little ahead of myself now we need to see how this this first year pilot worked and and what potential is there but i think there are some some really uh, uh, uh neat things that we could look at going forward i'll just add to that too that's exactly what we're looking at is using the model to come up with good hypotheses and then the citizen science, like Andrew just suggested, to test it. So the question included, hey, um, I have six ideas, and they are all go a long ways to, to reduce the recycle rate. Actually, the model and the math and the help of you guys will change that go a long ways to we expect it to reduce it by 80% or 90% or 40%. We can actually quantify it as a hypothesis. And then what Andrew said is, will you guys use you guys as citizen scientists to help us see how close we were. Are those things actually working? So we're trying to move fisheries management from, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Let's try it to let's do the math and let's do the citizen science to see if it actually works. It's just getting much more rigorous. And with you guys as help, it's going to work.
we've had some really good successes of citizen science with Trout Unlimited up in Edmonton, again, doing this pit tagging, looking at recycle rates of fish. Uh, it's really been a force multiplier for us. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I recognize we are over time and there's just one other question here that I'd like to um, read out before we move into our closing remarks. So thanks for sticking with us, folks. If you do have to run, don't worry, this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, so you'll be able to find it. But our last question here that we have is from Brett. And Brett is saying, would it not be a good idea to include guides in the study, uh, being that we're on the river pretty much every day, I track numbers, species, size, etc. for my own logs. And I'm sure I'm not the only guide out there that does this. So kind of speaking, Michael, to what you had just talked about. Yep. Hey, Janine, I can take that one. And this is a perfect dovetail. I thought I was going to have to find a spot to neatly plug our citizen science projects as part of our discussion this evening. But Andy and Mike just beat me to the punch. So that's fantastic. But I do see this as being part of uh, that engaging the guides. We get lots of interest from anglers in the guiding community to be involved in looking and loving the Bow River. People are very, very passionate about it. And that's absolutely clear to, to all of us in fisheries management that work in the South here. So I guess just to start out a couple of things, we do have some stakeholders that are on our cumulative effect science team, as Paul mentioned, and uh, some of those are tied into the guiding community. So that is one way that we're engaging uh, guides. And then as Mike and Andy mentioned, we've got a couple citizen science projects that we are piloting this year. So one of them is the tagging study. So that's giving some guides and anglers, these pit tag readers, as Andy mentioned, to follow up on the population and the marking uh, of rainbows and browns and whitefish that we did in September this year. And we're continuing to collect that information through the fall. And I would imagine we have continue to do that into the spring. And then the other one that we haven't really talked about um, tonight is a avian predation bird survey that we also started as a citizen science pro project this year. And that was primarily to try to get a little bit more information to inform one of the threat metrics in our cumulative effects model. As Mike showed on his slide, some of the things that we looked at just initially anyway, avian predation was one of them. So we asked uh, the guiding community if there were people that would be involved in just downloading this app and a survey on their phone and going out and collecting data. We're trying to get information from the Bear Spa reach all the way down to Carsland. And I, I won't go into any details tonight. We do have some data back from that. We got about 50 surveys or so, uh, but we're collecting data primarily on cormorants, mergansers and pelicans, just to see if we can kind of better inform some of the values that we use that, uh, in the modeling. So those are just two ways that we've been engaging uh, the public in general, but really specifically guides have been involved in this, the guiding community. So I guess just to say that we absolutely really value your contribution. Uh, I offered to kayak down the river with my colleague Sarah all summer to do the bird surveys, but somehow that just didn't seem like a good use of my time. So Anyway, as fun as that would have been, <laughs> you guys are the ones that are out there. You guys are the ones that are just uh, constantly on the river. And so that's why we're tapping into you as a resource. So as Stuart said, we'll be continuing to solicit feedback in the new year. And I really uh, believe that we're gonna have more of these types of opportunities in the future. So thanks a lot for the question. Great, thanks Jenny. So um, just to bring our session to a close and maybe this is a great place um, Stuart, to hear some closing remarks from you before we uh, just go over a couple of quick closing slides as well with next steps. Thank you, Janine. Um, you know, the Bow River, in addition to providing Albertans with a Blue Ribbon sport fishing opportunity, it, it provides a lifeline for the southern Alberta landscape, providing drinking water, irrigation, and power for millions of Albertans. I want to thank tonight's presenters for sharing AP, AAP's findings as well as the outreach team for facilitating this discussion. Um, lastly, and most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you, all of, uh, of you participants in tonight's uh, discussion for taking the time to learn more about the Bow River and providing your, your input. Um, please remember that this, uh, that this session is just the beginning of a number of opportunities that anglers will have to provide their, uh, learn more about the fishery and provide their input. I want to thank you again uh, for your participation. Over to you, Janine. Thank you. Great, thanks. 
So just to bring us home for our, our closing slides here. So if you don't um, follow us on Facebook, this is definitely an invitation for you to do so. Um, we are using that as one of our tools to be able to share information in terms of what our fisheries biologists as well as wildlife biologists are up to. Um, so a great opportunity to be able to sort of get an insider look to what the department is up to. But also um, we have a lot of information on alberta.ca as well as My Wild Alberta. So if you're looking for some of the reports that Paul was talking about or the fact sheet that was referenced, that's all on My Wild Alberta and you should be able to find it through a quick Google search. So for tonight as well, once you leave the webinar, you are going to be redirected automatically to a webinar survey so that you can provide feedback from this evening. And recognizing as well that, of course, tonight was just the beginning of a conversation. So as Stuart said, we've got a lot of folks who are on the call this evening who are very interested, which is great to see. And we are really just uh, starting to talk a lot more about the bow. So we've got a lot of work that's happening on it within the department, and you'll be hearing a lot more from us soon. So we will be taking all of the questions that uh, we received tonight and reviewing them. So if you didn't get your question answered live, um, don't worry, we are going to be uh, reviewing them and reading them and, and considering them going forward. Um, however, if you do have a question that you didn't get a response to from the panel this evening and you'd like uh, to have more follow up, uh, this really is an open invitation for you to get in touch with our, our fisheries biologist. So, of course, with Paul um, being our senior biologist for the Bow River, uh, you can see his contact information here. So you can feel free to reach out to him directly with, with more questions, or you can send us a message on Facebook or reach out through any of our, our general AEP channels because we are here um, to chat with you and share information and uh, work towards managing the Bow River. So thanks so much folks for spending your evening with us. I know we went a bit over time tonight, so thanks for giving us a few extra minutes and uh, we look forward to connecting with you more in the future. So thanks everybody and have a great night.